This podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners and viewers like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And to stay updated with video releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. I'm Rani Shatah, and this is The Beirut Banyan. that you're the story at the moment but i need to start things from my side okay go ahead no monday worries. to saturday this country is going through hell we all know what it feels like to be here everything's wrong waiting in line for gas hours on end the lira over 15000 to the dollar you're seeing your money depreciate further electricity cutouts every hour uh, the stress the toxicity of being here, the pressure on people, no government in sight, no accountability in sight, everything that could go wrong, going wrong. And for me, Sunday, if I can create a time off and a refuge and escape from this situation, the first thing I think of is Betroon. So I make my way with a half tank of gas. I'm betting that I'll get there and come back with enough fuel. And it's just a few seconds of sitting down in a fairly pretentious restaurant in Betsrun, but pretending like I'm not in Lebanon for a few seconds. The Mediterranean, the music, the food, it could be anywhere in the Mediterranean. So it's just a, it's a refuge, maybe, from everything that's going wrong. And it's a feeling. But then those few seconds are interrupted by someone that we both saw at this restaurant. <laughs> and, you know, I was speaking with my aunt. She was sitting next to me. Yeah. We were talking about how it's so strange that people are tolerating, mm -hmm. they're accepting a very unusual situation, an extremely unpopular figure who's fairly at ease, surrounded by customers who may have differing opinions about him, a lot of protection, the bodyguards and the like. And it's just, it's a little too calm. It's a little too normal. We were, we were talking about this. And then sort of he gets up, the entourage is leaving. And I think it's just within a second or two, you become a fixture on Lebanese television. And it echoes now throughout the country. And that begins what is just maybe a minute, maybe two minutes, a very quick turn of events where you decide to do things on your terms and you speak up when the restaurant isn't speaking up, when many people are not saying anything, but those frustrations are inside, they're real. You speak your mind. And for me, I haven't seen that kind of individual uh, courage in, in a long time and that you risked your physical well-being, your phone took a hit. Add to that, an idiot like me approaches you. <laughs> it's like, how can it get any worse? <laughs> and I, I try to introduce myself quickly without trying to bother you at the same time, just telling you that you have a friend if you ever want to talk. So I'm a lucky, lucky man that you're willing to talk less than, it's just a day ago. So I'm, I'm honored, I'm flattered. And I want to give you the floor, Yasmin. I've already said way too much. I'd like to just hear it from your side. Media says many things. There's, indiv there's independent media. There's Instagram feeds. There's all types of things being said. Your words, I don't think, have been said properly yet. Even when TV anchors are interviewing you, there's too much interjection. I, I, I felt so uncomfortable when they tried to ask you, well, Walid Jumblot is standing up for you. What do you think about that? I think this was Al Jadid yesterday. I just want to hear it from you. It's the advantage of a podcast. Take as long as you'd like. I want it from your side. Exactly what happened, why you decided to do that at that moment, why you took that step, and how things unfolded. As much as you'd like to say on your terms. 
Yeah, first of all, I just want to really, really thank you for that, for just expressing the general opinion, although I'm sure you, you've you also been attacked a lot, maybe, or just objected a lot, and it takes a lot of courage to keep on doing what you do. Uh, so that really thank you. And sometimes out of the most negative events, you just have positive events, like meeting people that, you know, the interesting people and people who will support you later. So that's the start. Another thing that's very... Uh, um, positive about this that we're doing right now, basically on the news, on the Lebanese news and the Arabic news. I know I am Lebanese, but we all know that Lebanon is, is a country where we speak three languages. And I have a lot of difficulty expressing myself in Arabic because I was French educated. I went to a French private high school. So basically I couldn't really express everything that I'm feeling. So this is like, again, a great opportunity to actually speak up. And now I'm gonna tell you the story again, the way it happened, I'm just gonna say it again. And right now in English, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So basically, I was just exactly like what you were saying. I had a chance to feel like I was away from Lebanon for like, three, and I was exactly saying that to my friend. We were talking about it. And we're like, oh my God, thank God. I feel like a little bit in Greece, you know, like it's not really Greece, but it's just like, thank God, you know, like we have a place, we still have a place like that where there's a public beach. I was thinking about that all the time when I was eating. I was like, thank God we're not paying a hundred thousand, whatever, to just enter a public beach, which is complete corruption and completely like, all the, the the buildings on the you know on the shore it's all illegal anyway and all the private beaches anyway this being said I, we were just talking about that and you know i i try you know i try to, to protest sometimes i speak up my mind but i never got an opportunity like actually seeing one of them in front of me hmm. for me it's an unmissable opportunity uh, this guy has done a lot of harm just like other guys just to be fair with everyone uh and seeing him is like Obviously, I'm not going to shut up. There's no, how can you shut up? I mean, what, what, what were you thinking if you actually not say anything? And it was very spontaneous for me because I was actually just looking. I see Jagan Vesi, it's like you gave me $1 million. I'm like, oh my God. And I just said, Fihalik, because like, that's the minimum you can say. What, are you, what else are you going to say? And I'm, I was still being respectful, you know? Yasmin, did, did you see him? Did you see him coming in? Yeah, I, and there's something that was very provocative. It was he came in with a big smile, like a really big smile. And I got so annoyed with that. So you saw him coming in and then going out at the end? Oh, no, excuse me. I didn't see him coming in. I just saw him coming out. Okay. The reason I'm asking you is that I actually saw him coming in. And it took me a while to process that it was him. And it's because, like you, I've never seen him in person. I've seen, I've seen other figures. I've seen other politicians in person. But they, they're always exactly the opposite of how I imagined them. And I didn't realize he's a fairly small person yeah. with his baseball cap and sort of in a bit, he seemed a bit sort of maybe not, not nervous, but he, d he did not look comfortable. And it just took me, it took me a few seconds to like, oh my God, that's him. That's him. And it's funny. I heard him saying bonjour, sort of saying hello as people were walking by him and he's entering the restaurant. So that for me, it startled me. It's like, oh, this, that's him. Anyway, I'm sorry I'm interrupting here, but it's just, it took oh, me time, right. took me time to realize. And then si si sitting in the restaurant, he was way in the back. I, oh, I felt that sort of tension within me that, is this where all this comes from? It's just that little guy sitting in the back and then he's <laughs> able to cause so much, well, animosity, right? And then as he stood up and left and when you sort of spoke your mind, it kind of, it's like, oh, no, no. There's ways to hold people to account, and you did that. So I'll, I'll give you the floor again. So you, you, you were able to speak your mind, and then the rebuttal was quick. And I'll, I'll let you say uh, what happened. Basically, what you said, this is exactly what I thought when I saw him, but everything went too fast, you know? Like, I didn't mm. have time to see him walk and think about it. But, like, when I saw him, I saw something very little too. That was my first reaction, like, oh, my God, he's small, you know? Right. And I saw the bodyguards more than him. They were all over the place and, and super big, you know, like, bigger than him. Mm. And to be honest, nothing worked in my head anymore. Like, I'm already a very impulsive person. I mean, how? what if I get even, like provoked by something you know like I already speak my mind all the time like basically in school I was out of this class all the time I was always out because I was saying things that I should be oh. saying so just imagine <laughs> when I see when I see, like just imagine so nothing is going to stop me no matter how you know I didn't even think about it twice and and again what I said is like whoa like it was low you know like somebody else could have been very very like more insulting yeah. there's one thing that I realized if you were asking yourself why no one was saying anything at the end these people knew exactly where they were, I think. 
mm. and they were in his hometown in his yeah. place but apparently he shares this place like as a business with someone else and this is something for me that didn't i didn't care about i didn't even know to be very honest i didn't even know and it wouldn't have stopped me anyway But that was the crazy thing is that people here knew that just don't touch the brand Bastille. You're not in a, you know, in a coffee shop in France. You're actually in his like <laughs> little, little town. And that, that's what I, I think made them okay with hitting me because they thought that in that thing, little thing, like what happens in Bachun stays in Bachun, like what happens at Mandaloon stays at Mandaloon. But I don't think they realized who they were actually doing this to because I'm, I'm, I'm a completely um, independent, you know, person with, with, with no um, um, pension for anyone politically, etc. So, and I'm only here for, for just a little bit of fun. Like I've, I don't connect with these people and I don't, I barely connect with anyone in Lebanon anyway. So that for me didn't scare me. It was more for me like, oh my God, where are human rights? I, I want to ask you just a step further, as much as you can say, was it simply that you said and then that brought in the physical confrontation or is there something in the middle that happened? Because I've been hearing, I've, I've been hearing all types of interpretations, and I wanted yeah. just to hear exactly what happened. Yeah, look, I understand that at the end of the day, it's my word against against his word. Like I know whatever I'm going to say, they're going to try and justify it more. But I'm telling you, I mean, you're free to believe me. The, the public is free to believe me. It was literally that Fehalik, and he came and said, "Shut your mouth," in Arabic, like So I yeah. I got up and I was like, "What are you going to do? You're going to hit me?" And he started hitting me. And that was it. That was it. That was all. You know, I actually, I, I saw this happening at a corner. And then yeah. I saw you, I, I think this is true. You tell me if this is correct. I know it's in the heat of the moment. I think yeah. I saw you run after them. Yeah, that's what I did when I, he beat me. He left because he, he thought, le- yes. I, yes. that's it, you know. And I, I took my phone back. I opened the camera and I started filming him. And I said, you're, you're a coward, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to film you. And he, he started beating me again. So that's your imagery. That, that's your video. Yeah, that's my video, actually. Oh, From I all the public, I was the one taking a video <laughs> like nobody else. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, I mean, it really speaks also to the moment that this is, in a way, the most obvious form of citizen journalism. You're getting attacked. You yeah. turn your phone around, you film, and then it goes viral. And now thousands, tens of thousands, if not more, have seen what you shared. I didn't know it's your footage. So there you yeah. go. It's just one one person, and we're able to see it all through your eyes. Yeah. And but may I ask you, just in a psychological way, where did that confidence come from? Because I don't know many people that would be able to stand up against an armed security team, and literally almost in a in a not to make too, not to make it light here, but that it is quite impressive. You're saying, what are you going to do? punch me, beat me up. And then you, you know, in a way it's almost, it's not inviting an attack on the contrary. It just shows the level of confidence you have. Where does that come from? Look, I'm going to be very honest with you. Now I see myself with like a bit more of um, detachment because I'm 31. Like I kind of learned to understand, to, to try to understand myself, but I literally since the day I was born, I think even from, from the time I was in my mom's, you know, belly, apparently I was always kicking and I wanted to get out. I was like such a rebel. <laughs> I got into so much trouble in my life for speaking up my mind. Like, this is not the first time. Like, this is the first time it's on the media. <laughs> But the number of times I've done, like, I've said honest things that made people, like, really annoyed was a lot. Like, really. And, and people with a very high status, really. I, I've, I've, I remember, like, a couple of months ago, the same thing. I'm not going to talk about the story, but somebody who thought he was, like, super important. And I also kind of told him a lot of truth. Somebody related to the government, I'm going to say, but anyway. Um, and I don't know where it comes from, but for me, the fastest way to a solution is just saying it as if there is no reason to go on, like, you know, hiding things and camouflage and stuff like that. There's no reason. If you really want to get to a solution, even if, you know, I always say this to my friends, if you love someone, tell them the thing the way it is. Maybe they're going to they're gonna hate you. They're not going to talk to you. And uh, I'm not a diplomatic person. I know people who are with me, they actually really love me because I cannot be diplomatic. Like if you're, if you're afraid, just go. But I always tell my friends, if you care about someone, say it. Say, he's going to get something. Something's going to get in his ear and he's going to change somehow. Even if it, you're not making your friendship like amazing, you know, but you really care. That, that, that's the important thing. Yasmin, is this, is this a building up of tension within you? 
because the reason I'm asking it in a, in a sort of, med- maybe it's mediocre of me to ask it this way, but I'm just trying to find the, the moment that you see and then you decide to act on it. Is it that you're already to the, you're at the tipping point by default? And then this, I'm- yeah, because I just don't, you, you, you know the restaurant, hundreds of people are seating, are seated, are seated. And I don't think everyone there likes him. And you're right, it is his hometown. That restaurant belongs to a relative, yes, but I, it's not that every customer is a fan. And clearly you're not, but no one else is doing that, not, not even saying anything, but you decided to act. And I know that you're, you're making it very clear that you've been programmed this way from day one, but I'm, yeah. <laughs> is, it, is it just, is it the Lebanese experience that made you reach the tipping point or, or is it something else that it's something really directed at what he represents to you? Is there something more about him? No. Okay. No, it's really, really not about Gibran. Not at all. I mean, we all know that he's one of the most uh, hated and the most corrupt. That doesn't make him the only one. Obviously, he has to understand that. Like, if he ever listens to me, it's not personal about you. It's about you and your whole system. I would be driving in, in Ashafi and seeing these things, whereas it could be for you insignificant and it's fine. And, I, and for me, like, hits me all the time. Like, the poverty, the roads, the... The, 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 how the roads are made, like how, how, how ugly the scenery is and how much we could have been doing from this country and what we actually did. Like you have a gem, you have a piece of land, which is a gem and you're making it the ugliest place. There is nothing about the environment, no respect for, for recycling, no respect for the air, for the pollution, nothing, nothing, no respect for the elderly, no plan for retirement. It, it's such a mess that, yes, when you tell me I'm bottled up, because these are things that I put in every day and I cannot actually do something about it because I'm not a public figure. I'm not somebody who has an impact. I'm no one. And then you get a chance to actually hit that person that you hate. And of course, you're going to do it. So so it's, it's really just being here and having so much pressure within you that when the moment comes, it's going to happen. Yeah, and it's a pressure that comes from a very long time ago. I remember I was 18 when I started begging to leave Lebanon because I hated this place. And I always said it's too much. Like everybody wanna, wants to have a porch, like a, the car. Everybody wants to have a, two houses or three houses. And everybody wants to have a, a, a nice number for, you know, the plates. <laughs> and, and I was like, I hated that. I used to tell my friends who used to enjoy Lebanon so much because, you know, it's a good life, blah, blah. I said, I cannot live in this place. There's no respect for the public, for, for the public, um, how do you say, like, the, le bien public. I don't know how you say well, that. I mean, English. I mean, the, the well-being of, of society. The well-being of the public. Like, you, you see no, no, no public garden, no public schools. There are no public schools in Lebanon that are actually decent. Why would you pay for a private school? Why would you work all your ass off all day to pay for your kids to go and have an education? Why? But okay, so you've been here at least since October 17. So yeah. you, so you've experienced the protest movement. And yeah. I didn't want to appear stalkerish or creepy, but I did want to see I, I tried visualizing your your world a bit. So on Instagram, just sort of seeing the photos that are available, and I saw that you were taking part in the protests at times, and that you had you you in a way you expressed yourself in a way that resonates among thousands of people that took part in the protests so there's nothing unusual there but in terms of your outlook and i know this is a big question for a fairly small incident in the grand scheme of things but i'd I'd like to know your your opinion as somebody who's here who's immensely frustrated who finds an opportunity to stand up to the system and becomes maybe it's a momentary thing but becomes a national debate a national discussion even his office issued a reply and a reply that's rather embarrassing. Yeah, so we won't take insults anymore without reprisal, which is yeah. the worst kind of reply you can say to at least try to de-escalate things. It makes it worse. And it's, the messaging is wrong. Wrong is being diplomatic here. But, but you're, the way you see things, having been away for some time, having wanted to leave in the past, seeing all the flaws in this country, do you see a way out? And is this, in your opinion, one of those avenues? Meaning, I'm going to quote you, and I hope I got this word for word, and I really enjoyed this quote, but I tried to translate it just to make sure I could say it in English correctly. This country is not Bashar's Syria. It's not Saddam's Iraq. It's not Putin's Russia. This is Lebanon. You can speak your mind, and that's the way forward. Is that for you 
really what what's at stake really that the public has to do things that they're not doing and that includes direct confrontation in ways that people find perhaps discomforting even on a sunday even in bedroom even when it's one person but that this is something that should be replicated i wanted to really unpack that quote because I, i liked it resonated with me but I'll, i'll let you explain what what you meant what i think is that just to be fair i'm not going to blame people for also being scared because it is completely a human nature thing to actually get scared like i was here the second day after the explosion when we were all down at the sahi to shuhada and and we we also got like very scared like it was just one day after the explosion and they were hitting on us so you cannot blame the people who are like i don't want to lose my life not oh, everybody yeah. and you cannot blame them has the courage to actually lose lose their life it is normal but what i blame the lebanese for it's not just speaking your mind is fine you're not going to change anything anyway i i'm not gonna, i'm not going to have like a huge impact i mean i hope so but anyway speaking your mind is not the thing it's actions and what i actually like to criticize in lebanon i've always said it i've said it like a long time ago i was still a teenager i've noticed it and this is not a criticizing because it's part of me too like we're all mm. we all have that it's a gene i think i don't know what it is it's just individualism it is crazy how we think of ourselves like you could be the most talented person you're not going to go for the public sector you're going to be doing either like you're going to be a doctor you're going to be an architect an engineer you're going to be excellent at what you do huh? a businessman but all that talent you're not putting in to change the country why because you know you don't make money in the public sector but why aren't you thinking of your country why are you going into business why aren't you going out you have an education go and go in the public sector it's okay if you don't make a fortune it's fine you just think of your country and what what happens is that right now our public sector the people who are working there are not at the highest level if you know what i mean and and are not produ- not giving their best and they're most of them 90% of the people who get into the public sector are getting through a you know a hazard like they otherwise they don't get in i have personally friends who live that they see what's happening in the in the public sector it's so biased you know what i mean but i like what you're saying is that you yeah. can shine but the system yeah. doesn't let you shine within the public sector I think I think people like to just have I think want to be a doctor an engineer an architect it's like these these professions that are so well perceived mm. but when it comes to just being somebody who's having an average life with an average lifestyle but you're part of the public sector and you're actually doing something for the country for your country to be rich not for you to be rich this is what I mean here we can right, enrich right. ourselves forever and we're all rich in Lebanon did you know someone who wasn't rich before somebody who's not driving a Porsche somebody who doesn't have like at least three properties in Lebanon I mean, I'm exaggerating, but if you know I what I mean, know. like the, the, the sector, you know, the <laughs> sure sector where, where I grew up, which is so fake, because at the end of the day, why are you making so much money for yourself? Are you, do you realize you're living in a country with no normal roads, no normal public sector, no respect for any, for anything or anyone? Work for your country. It's not about how successful you are abroad. Okay, we're let's... Living a born businessman. We're not doubting you're going to make it, but why aren't you going into the public sector? And why are all these private schools? And I also blame the private schools. One of them that I've been to are making their best for us to be highly educated. Perfect. We speak three languages. We're smart. We go to Paris and we get employed like that. What, whatever. But they're not educating us to go into again the public sector. I didn't even have like an emphasis in, at school. on the class of terbiya madaniya the last thing we were thinking about but why why aren't we learning about the history and how to actually like enter the public sector may I ask you and i know i'm pushing a bit too far here because i know it's not maybe it's not your i'm asking a bit too much from somebody who just literally did something that they spoke their mind but i'm i'm curious when you say action may i just ask what what you mean exactly yeah. beyond beyond a yeah. brave move that you did yesterday because that is a no. that is a form of action. I know it's it's a bit maybe it's more expression, but it's more than that. You actually expressed yourself physically in front of somebody, not online where everyone is shouting. So what what exactly does action mean? What it means is that we like too much our comfort. What I mean is that there was an explosion one week later we were partying. What I mean is that stop thinking about your own like oh there's a your lebanese are people of the moment like if the moment is good it's perfect that's why the moment is always good with the lebanese like it's fun but they don't think like further so what i mean with actions is that there is so much with your brain instead of just have like seeking the laziness and the fun of the moment and everything 
which is great for them. Like we, we're, we're the most fun, entertaining people. I'm not saying this is bad, but you know how systematic the Germans are and how criticizing the French are and how whatever, they are making nations. Why? Because they're thinking further. We in Ashafi, the Ashafi people are going to Batoun all summer. Didn't, don't you realize, and I'm one of them, by the way, because I was at Mandaluna, I didn't know it was, it was for Gibran. It's for Gibran. We're, we're giving him money. Like, this is the actions that I'm saying. Like, think, you know, like, let's just not be people who just want to have fun all the time. I, I, I will never take the position of trying to defend someone like him. So it's not, that's not what I'm trying to do here. But I, I think, my understanding, I could be wrong on this, is that there are many properties, many businesses in particular, that are either friends of his, or perhaps I think Mand- I think it, Mandalun is through a relative, I think. So uh, I'm not sure exactly how it works, but yeah. it seems, it feels like there's a lot of places in Betrun that are yeah. sympathetic Fine. maybe, or there's some network and financial and, and otherwise. You, you are part of the protest movement. I know that. Uh, you, you are a, a latter-day protester, if you will. You kind of came out of nowhere yesterday and kind of brought some momentum back to the, to the screens. And uh, I'm really just trying to understand that whether or not this is a fait accompli. Because what you're describing to me is a situation that probably will never take shape in Lebanon, where people rethink all their allegiances. And that includes groups that are designed to do the complete opposite and i never saw i never saw that sentiment among even even enough of the protesters that there's that real desire to rethink everything and i don't know if that's maybe being too bleak too pessimistic but but i i'm just you did something yesterday that seemed to send a bit of a shockwave and it 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 worked and i was trying to just pinpoint that if that's not the answer then exactly what is and what could be done so that that kind of shock way, that electricity continues. And I hope I'm asking this the right way. It sounds sloppy oh, listening to myself. No, no, you, you, you make a lot of sense. Like I'm with you, uh, really. It's one line, the way we think we're on the same level. But um, I've been thinking when you were talking and I think there are three important solutions. First of all, for the brains of the country, like the, the people who are, you know, can strategically redefine something for the politics of Lebanon, but strategically, not just like blah, 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 and still with the same parties, like strategically redevelop something for Lebanon. Mm. But we're talking about not, not like you, like, like me and you, for example. I don't know, like I'm not, I'm not judging, but I mean, like we are still people who are, if you want part of a community where we still hang out, like we go out, we're, we're public, we talk. There must be people who are just, excuse me, like, I'm not going to compare it to Elon Musk, but I mean, you know, like what I mean, like the people who are introverts and with the brain and can be like very strategical about something. I don't know how I'm sounding right now, but I have a picture of these people. And like, let, let's say Les Lumières, you know, like Les Lumières, what, what happens, how they, 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 they recreated the whole system. Like you, you need that in Lebanon. You need a new constitution and, it, and it's very specific people who can do it, but they need to mobilize and do it. That's, that's the first for me. That's the first thing. To be and, more united with that, with the group meetings that are systematic, mm. not individualistic. Like, yeah, we have one activist in Lebanon. Okay, perfect. And then he's, a, he's another activist. Just unite. Talk every evening for six months and make a plan. One. Second, try to pull the, to push the army away, like to turn the army, because that for me is the solution. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Once the army is with the people, you're done. The system is done. Basta. They're done. Two and three, not they're done because we both know there's a militia who's armed, etc. But the army is a very big, big point. And the last thing that's like a long term solution and important plan for Lebanon educate people to go into the public sector. The new generation, when they graduate, don't tell them they need to apply to, to Columbia and whatever universities all over the world. No, go into the public sector. That's it. In a way, it sounds like going back to October 17, 18, and 19, and re- re-energizing the masses and rethinking maybe what happened afterwards and trying to go back to what really is almost like a concrete way out of this mess. And it, it, it starts, I think, these, these ideas were born out of a tipping point where so many bad things happened right before October 17, 
and that WhatsApp text was just the last straw. And yeah. people went people went insane and they they broke free for a moment. And they they really, I mean, they reclaimed some authority. And I think uh, I think all of us in different ways are reaching separate tipping points. Uh, yours was yesterday in a way, even though you you described yourself as very uh, undiplomatic anyway, but I think it does take some pressure, immense pressure to see that moment and then act on it. I think it's also difficult to do that when you're out with friends, when there's hundreds of people watching. I think it's it's difficult. And I think somebody would do something like that, not you in particular, but anyone in your situation, if they've reached their tipping point. I think we are one by one. I think it's happening. And uh, yours is the most recent example. And yeah. I think you found a way to actually explain exactly what happened in a very coherent way. And you're very kind to give me your time 24 yeah. hours after that kind of a mess happened. Thank so, so thank you, Yasmin. And uh, welcome to the limelight. Thank you. <laughs> Whatever I can do to more like to expose things, I'm, I'm all yours. Like, well, I'm rich. <laughs> I mean, listen, if I ever need extra followers on Instagram or Twitter, yeah. can do me a favor. <laughs> Can I walk by you and just scream, yeah. scream at me? Yeah. I have a better idea. We're going for lunch in Batroon soon. Just you and I. Oh, oh that- we're, gonna tell, <laughs> we're gonna tell people like, look, we're back and we're not gonna stay away from Batroon. Well, <laughs> so here you have the followers. I think those are the followers that I'll probably be running away from. <laughs> 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 no, I, I really appreciate your time, Yasmin. I look forward to reconnecting in person as well. Thank you. Thanks for listening and watching. And a friendly reminder to support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan.